Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Lysico of the Des Moines Register, along with Dargan Southard of the Des Moines Register. We were in Iowa City last night for the NCAA selection show. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, uh, text groupers, and for your feedback. We decided to do it this morning rather than late at night. Give us a chance to digest the bracket a little bit more. Gave me a chance to get home. Uh, trying on this green sweatshirt for the first time. I got it for Christmas. Uh, haven't worn it once, but I decided today is the day. I thought it'd be kind of weird to wear it yesterday on St. Patrick's Day, like to the press conference. So uh, here we are, debuting the green sweatshirt, or Dargan. And uh, we got a, a bracket to talk about. We don't have an opponent yet for the Hawkeyes, but we know they're going to play at 2 p.m. on Saturday on ABC. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if if you want to start with what was surprising, that was really the only thing to me that was super surprising was that the first round games are going to, I was set up to play Saturday, Monday, instead of Friday, Sunday. Don't think it'll really make that big of a difference. Cause I was obviously going to sell out the game. No matter. They could have played it at three in the morning on Monday and I would probably would have sold it out. Um, so that's not that huge of a deal. Um, I guess the thing that that jumps out to me first is, you know, if you kind of scan the reactions nationally um, across the board, the narrative right now is that Iowa got not only the toughest bracket, but, you know, a, t a bracket loaded with familiarity with the Hawkeyes and all that. And, um, you know, while there are some teams in Iowa's bracket that have played well for extended stretches this year and, um, you know, were, were highly ranked at one point, um, I actually really like Iowa's draw. and it feels manageable given what it could have been. And so, you know, you, you kind of go through here and um, you know, a lot of talk about the Kansas state potential matchup that, that, it, it, you know, when you think about it, um, they could potentially play a non-conference opponent three times in one year. Like, I don't even know how you would possibly do that other than the way that this coincidence has lined up. So I did agree with Lisa Bluter that I was surprised to see, Iowa and Kansas State, you know, potentially playing each other again. Um, we'll get into it later, but I actually think the familiarity there favors Iowa um, and isn't a detriment. So, um, and then, you know, the, the bottom half of the bracket with LSU and UCLA kind of headlining things there, um, you know, it, it seemed inevitable that the committee was going to set Iowa up to, you know, a, a, a glitzy matchup with somebody um, you know, before the final four and, and LSU obviously fits that bill, but I'm, I'm going to go on record here. And I say that for one reason or another, the Iowa LSU matchup will not materialize. So if it, if it, if you're asking me to pick, I think it's, I think it's UCLA and UCLA is a good team. Um, one that, that has some, some things that can certainly give Iowa problems, but you know, you get to the elite eight and everybody's good most likely. And so um, to me, that doesn't, necessarily feel like a a stretch to to have that be the elite eight opponent so um yeah. and then of course you know if you look at last year none of the predictions that i just said seed wise <laughs> actually happened so there's that element to it as well but um i i actually like the way that that everything shaked out for the hawkeyes so i think the team that got the worst draw in this region is ucla <laughs> because uh you know, losing in the Pac-12 semifinals dropped them from a sure one seed mm -hmm. to the number seven overall seed in the tournament. Uh, and now they get to – and then LSU, you know, goes to a ten, the 10 overall seed. That's how they do it. So, um, you know, and UConn, I think, was the – would have been the nine overall seed. Is that right? No, they would have been the 11. Anyway. Yeah. That, that's so, I – yeah. So, uh, let's just go through the bracket. So mm -hmm. those that haven't seen it, you're listening to the podcast. You don't even really know what's going on for the first time. <laughs> so Iowa's a one seed, first time since 1992. Uh, and as Dargan said, it's it's the benefit. It's a beneficial draw for a one seed, honestly. Like through the first three games, I feel like I don't feel like there's anything crazy there that Iowa can't overcome. And that's what you want as a one seed. You want that reward. Like if you're a two seed. You're going to face LSU in the Sweet 16. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Iowa did a great job of earning this one seed. Enjoy that. And, you know, it's still going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. But the one seed, so they'll face either Tennessee Martin or Holy Cross on Saturday. We're not going to waste <laughs> a lot of time talking about that. That game will be Thursday in Carver, by the way, if you want to watch Iowa's next opponent. Uh, <laughs> Should be a rocking environment, I would assume. Yeah. Uh, 
that that game, I'm there's no reason to worry about that. So we're not no. going to talk about that. Uh, Monday night against either West Virginia or or uh, Princeton. I'm sorry, not Creighton, but Creighton is an Iowa's bracket, by the way. Uh, that will be interesting. We'll talk about that. Then it would be uh, Colorado is the five, five. seed. Yep. Kansas State is the four. Of course, Iowa met Colorado as a six in the Sweet 16 last year. And also, just FYI, also in the top bracket is Drake. Drake, the 12th seed. Uh, that'll be interesting. I, I don't think that's impossible that they beat Colorado. Who's well, slides, and I mean, so. yeah, you look at Drake was in Iowa's bracket last year and nearly beat Louisville in the first game that would have changed the whole bracket. So, yeah, I mean, Drake Drake's going to have a, a little bit of an uphill battle to get to a matchup with Iowa. But, you know, I think that's the biggest, you know, everybody talks about, oh, the women's game is so much better and the parody is so much better. I feel like that's one of the biggest differences is now on the women's side, you can actually realistically talk about like a 12 beating a five or, you know, a 12 getting to the sweet 16. Whereas, you know, not too long ago, not only would the one seed roll to the final four, but they would beat, you know, win their first three games by 30, 40 points. So um, I think that's been one of the biggest improvements and and reasons for excitement so much with the women's tournament is now these upsets that you see so much on the men's side um, have a chance to materialize way more than they used to. Yeah. So let's, let's just table the LSU UCLA conversation for just a little bit. And let's just focus on the upper half of the Albany two bracket. We should met, should emphasize here that Iowa is in Albany, not Portland. Uh, should it advance to the sweet 16, which I feel like, in looking at the bracket, Dargan is a could be a huge benefit because uh, they're the two through five seeds. You know, the most likely seeds to make the Sweet Sixteen are not East Eastern teams. You got a Southern no. team in LSU, you got a West Coast team in UCLA, another Pac-12 team in Colorado, and then K State is the other one. Um, so you're not. It's and that's not a notorious women's basketball traveling fan base. So, uh, South Carolina, in theory, would be in the Albany bracket, but that's the the complete other side of the whole sixty eight team deal, and they would play on a different day than Iowa. So, you're going to get a potential pro Iowa crowd in Albany versus, you know, some of Charlie Cream's pr- projections up until the final days had UConn as the three seed in Iowa's Albany region. So that also was avoided here. So again, I know we're looking at some of the positives, but um, I'm just saying the top, there are some, the all, I think the Albany thing plays into it. It's drivable. It's not easily drivable, but it is drivable from Eastern Iowa. We're not going to drive it, but no, I'm not going to be, drivable. if that happens, but uh, I will be booking a plane ticket. Uh but anyway, the top half of the bracket, Dargan, let's focus on that one by one because we'll get to mm-hmm. the LSU conversation. That's good to tease. Uh, right. Here. Uh, eight, nine matchup, West Virginia, Princeton. That's the real thing we probably should be talking about because that's most urgent on Monday night uh, after Iowa advances on Saturday. Uh, West Virginia, uh, 24 and 7. Princeton. Played UCLA to a three-point game earlier this year. These are not slouch teams. What do you make of those two teams right now, Dargan? Yeah, um, you know, obviously the the second round game has been, uh, well, two years ago it was the hurdle, and even last year was problematic at times. So um, I, I would imagine that, you know, those ACC, SEC teams that were, you know, several of them were kind of hovering in that 8 to 10 range, um, you know, I think – Avoiding one of those coming here is a good thing. You look at West Virginia's season; um, they were twenty and two on February sixth, and has since gone four and five. Um, and and you, as we get through these teams, that'll be a common theme of teams in Iowa's bracket have not necessarily finished the season well. Um, and so, you know, that's not always an indicative of how the tournament's going to go for those teams, but. Um, I think it certainly helps Iowa a little bit there. Um, it was interesting. I'm sure the masses have seen the the clip of the West Virginia coach. Uh, yes, this was running definitely on our mouth, list. Yeah, go running ahead. his mouth saying, "Hey, let's win one," and then send Caitlin Clark packing uh, or something to that degree. Um, that's uh, that's some that, bold words in general, but especially bold when you have an eight nine game that you have to win first. So um, 
uh, yeah, that was that was some interesting choice. And then Princeton, um, you know, I, I don't know if this will make a ton of difference, but Princeton actually came to Carver Hawkeye Arena back in 2019. And so it was this it was I looked it up. It was the same coach that's there now. Um, it was her first season. And uh, that game went to overtime on a just absurd banked in three at the horn um, that that sent that game to overtime. And, you know, it, you say, oh, well, that was five years ago or almost five years ago. Well, Kate Martin and Gabe, Gabby Marshall were on that team. And, you know, even though obviously the roster has changed and everything's like that, you know, that's just kind of a mental reminder, I'm sure, of of how quickly, you know, things could go wrong in this tournament. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I think eight and nine is a manageable scene for Iowa. Again, it's two teams that did a lot of winning this year, but um, maybe didn't quite play as well against the upper tier teams that they faced for Princeton in the non-conference and West Virginia going through the big 12, which was not an easy league this year. So, um, you know, Monday night at Carver Hawk arena, Caitlin Clark's last home game, uh, Kate right. Martin and Gabby Marshall's last home game. Yeah. Good um, point. Good point. It's going to be, it's going to be a lot of energy in there. And, um, you know, I feel like Iowa is comfortable with that tension, even if it does materialize on Monday because of what they've been through the last two years with that second round game. Um, and so I think that that will be, that could definitely be one of the first times uh, you see Iowa's kind of veteran presence and what they've been through make a difference because, you know, that was certainly a, a theme that materialized last night was, you know, Hey, this team this year, last year, the career, they've seen just about everything in every situation um, and, you know, that doesn't guarantee that it's going to go well, but it certainly doesn't hurt. And I think you could definitely see that make a difference um, on Monday night. Yeah. Caitlin said uh, Princeton's coach, Carla Barubi, was one of her coaches for the uh, Team USA. And I just looked at her bio and, and yeah, she led uh, that under 16 team to a gold medal, uh, U.S. under 16 team at the at the FIBA Americas. Uh, championships and the under 17 national team to a gold medal at the world championship. So I'm not sure if Caitlin was on both of those teams. I can't recall. Uh, she might've been. Um, yeah. But she, but she definitely sure. noted that, that that coach was one of her coaches. So again, there are pair, there are little threads to Caitlin Clark and Iowa throughout every piece of this bracket. And now the West Virginia coach has introduced himself into Caitlin Clark uh, history. <laughs> I imagine that <laughs> by clip, taunting uh, her. By taunting yeah. Her. I imagine that clip. Just as um, there's no chance back, she hasn't seen it. No. Yeah, well, and if you go it. back, go back to last year, um, if you remember to start, it was that southeastern Louisiana video. Where, oh, yeah. Um, right. I don't care if it was the coach or the player. I think it was. The it coach. Wasn't, it, it yeah, was the I think coach. it was the coach kind of started running, running the mouth and that got back to Iowa. And obviously that, you know, did that game unfolded as expected. So um, if Caitlin Clark and Iowa as a team haven't seen that yet. I'm sure they'll see it before Monday. Um, and that's uh poking the bear doesn't seem super smart there. Right. Uh, so as you said, so if, if Iowa does get past uh, the Iowa city bracket and what a disappointment that would be to, if somehow yeah. this season ended uh, Monday night uh, in Iowa city, I mean, that would just be, I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, how people know, would cope with that. Depending and, on who you ask, there's different, like, I guess, acceptable endings to this season, uh, not getting out of Carver would be not acceptable really in any fashion. Right. And, and I put this in my initial reaction column as I think a sweet, a sweet 16 exit also would qualify. I think, I think they've got to get to the elite eight to feel like, I don't know. It's been, a great se- it's been a great season, but you just, I mean, to go out in the Sweet 16 in Caitlin's senior year, Kate Martin's senior year, Gabby Marshall's senior year um, would be pretty disappointing. Now, it can happen. That's the thing I pointed out, too. I mean, for example, Indiana is a four seed in this bracket, Dargan. Uh, so that's the type of team you've got to beat here. It's not easy. And Iowa shot five for 28 from three against Indiana just less than a month ago. So... One cold shooting night from three, one off Caitlin Clark night. Heck, the, the way it looks like they're not going to be have Molly Davis back for a good amount of time yet, you know, foul trouble could really hurt, yep. you know, totally impact this team because the depth just is not there anymore. So 
Uh, we're not saying they they should breeze to the Elite Eight, but it would be a disappointment if they don't make the Elite Eight. So uh, refresh my memory. I was looking up some stuff. Did you talk about K-State and Colorado kind of entering on a slide already? No, we okay, haven't go gone ahead. there. And so, yeah, go for um, it. you know, that's, that's what you see a lot of times in that 4-5 range is maybe some teams that had some elite stretches during the season but maybe couldn't put it through you know from you know the whole year and Kansas State and and Colorado pretty much fit that exactly um just looking at some records here uh Kansas State was uh 20 and 1 on January 27th and has since gone 5 and 6 um and you know that was Ayoka Lee coming back from an injury um so that was that was certainly a little bit explainable, but, um, you know, they did get to the Big 12 title game, but not as not as strong of a finish as the start. And then Colorado's was even more drastic. I mean, they were 20 and three on February 9th and have gone two and six since then with uh, a lot of ranked losses to, to the, up, you know, the upper echelon of the Pac-12. So, um, yeah, I, I 100 percent agree. You know, I think if it had been you know, a, a team with maybe a little more historical prestige that Iowa had to face in the Sweet 16, you could maybe say, okay, that's not, not, you know, that's not what Iowa fans want, but it's understandable. But I think you got to beat Kansas State or Colorado if you want to, you know, fully put the stamp on your elite presence in the sport. Um, and so, you know, if you look, uh, obviously the Kansas State familiarity was a big topic. Um, but I actually think that, you know, you, you think about the NCAA tournament and unfamiliarity is all is such a common hurdle, you know, whether it's what sends you home or what advances you, you know, taking advantage of matchups that teams have a very short window to prepare for. And so for Iowa to, you know, probably just refresh itself on the Kansas State scout, um, I feel like that's going to make. I, I feel like that benefits Iowa, especially because that second win or the second game against Kansas State down in Florida came without Hannah Stolke. And so that she had gotten hurt, you know, that Friday down in Florida. And so, you know, when you look at the the two matchups against Kansas State, the first one in Carver where Caitlin Clark had one of the worst games of her career, that feels much more like an anomaly than the second matchup which was a close game where Iowa kind of pulled it out at the end. So um, my, I, you know, just my opinion, I think that Iowa should feel good about the Kansas state matchup. And you know that, Hey, you know, if it, if it does, if that's what's materialized and that's what sends Iowa home, you at least knew what you were expecting to get. It wasn't some big surprise, something that you didn't prepare for. And so I feel like that would be a little easier to, to wrap your head around um, as everybody kind of tries to, to figure out teams on the fly. So, um, and, and that Kansas state Colorado game is going to be a good one in Manhattan too. If that's what, if that is what materializes, I could see either team winning that. So um, I, I think it's a good reminder as I heard Caitlin Clark over, overheard her talking to some people is um, you know, they're not going to have to play everybody in this bracket. So um, as much as the depth there seems like a problem, um, you know, they're only going to have to play a handful of these teams. And so I think that's important to remember as you kind of dissect and, and look at everything that could possibly happen. Right. Uh, yeah, it's definitely key to focus on if you're Iowa, uh, you know, you can get halfway to the final four just by taking care of business here in Iowa city, um, over the next couple of days uh you know by yeah. monday night so uh that's what you gotta try to do lisa bluter did say uh someone asked her real late last night um you know would you rather face fresh teams or would you ra rather face familiar teams she said she would rather face newer teams um i think iowa has a lot of confidence in its scouting ability with jenny fitzgerald she's incredible you get um you get so you know, she gets I, I know they've been working on some of these potential eight, nine matchups. Jan Jensen even said last night they weren't working on UCLA, but they're working on uh, taller players uh, mm -hmm. like UCLA is going to have potentially in the elite eight. So they've been working on a little bit of that stuff. Uh, and she said that the one thing Bluter said about the familiarity is 
she likes it when a team hasn't faced Caitlin Clark before because they don't know what it's like. You know, you just see the highlights on TV. We saw that play out last year, right? I mean, it was, you know, she dominated at <laughs> Louisville. She dominated Colorado. She dominated South Carolina. Um, you know, she, she kind of ran through the bracket there. And, um, you know, K-State does have that familiarity, like you said. I mean, they, they have plans to defend her. We saw, um, you know, we've seen Nebraska at times have success with Caitlin, you know, second or third time around I mean, it took a while for nebraska admittedly right. but um but anyway uh, so well, I don't know. And, there's two yeah, sides and, of it because they've seen iowa before too yeah and and you know i think probably another reason why iowa um could take advantage of the unfamiliar unfamiliarity is going back to a quote that Cynthia falter said after the big 10 tournament was you know we're a hard scout because we don't even know fully what we're going to do when we get out there. And so I think, I think I, I do agree that, um, that what it is to Iowa's benefit when they face a team that hasn't, you know, dealt with the Caitlin Clark experience. Um, I can definitely see why that would be, um, something that you would feel good about. Um, but again, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, a big mental perception of this whole thing is, um, you know, did Iowa get a tough path or do the other teams have a tough path because I was in there as well. And so, um, you know, you're a one seed, you're at the top. There's a, a mental pressure that inevitably comes with that. But at the same time, like you have the, the chance to take charge of the bracket and really kind of dictate things. So um, it, it feels like Iowa has mentally put itself in a position where it feels that way. And so, um, you know, we'll see what happens over the next few weeks. Yeah, I'm uh, not to – I'll just tease it a little bit, but I'm putting together a piece um, on Caitlin this week about her postseason success. She is 20 – not just her, but since she's been at Iowa, she is 20 and 4 in postseason play, and that's <laughs> – Silly. I mean, that's like playing your tournament-level teams. That's like Mahomes, you know, when yeah. they talk about his playoff record – like his career, he's got like more playoff games than like a season, and his playoff numbers are like you know five thousand some yards, you know, hardly any turnovers, tons of wins, hardly you know it's it's like that for Kayla. twenty and four, and two of those losses obviously were as a freshman. Um, maybe I'm am I missing one? Maybe I'm missing. No, I'm not, because she's had three losses in the NCAA's and one in the Big Ten tournament. So that's it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Well, and uh, so she's going to step – I think she's going to rise to the occasion is all I'm saying. Well, and and um, going back to – this is kind of a side story, but the the breakdown that Tim Legler had on on SportsCenter with Scott Van Pelt, I thought, you know, Scott Van Pelt asked him, you know, what is the one thing about Caitlin that stand, makes her apart from everyone else? And I thought Legler summed it up perfectly by saying she makes moments – that should be really stressful and really hard and really, you know, a big deal. She makes them look very easy. And so I think that plays into what you just said about the NCAA tournament success. And especially now knowing that this, she knows this is her last NCAA tournament. Um, I, I think it's no surprise that somebody like her with the mental fortitude that she has, you know, relishes these moments and has probably in a way been waiting for this moment the whole year. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes we get uh, a little, I don't know, um, Caitlin's production sometimes seems a little redundant and I guess, uh, you know, doesn't always pop for people who have been covering her as much, but you look up in the casual stat lines that she's able to generate where it doesn't even feel like she's played that well. And you look up and she has 35 points at the end of the game. The number of times that she's able to do that on top of all the, you know, incredible performances really kind of sets the stage for, you know, what I feel like. And, and a lot of people feel like is going to be a, a big ending here. Yeah. That just makes me think like since the Creighton loss, I'm going to, I'm going to tabulate her, her postseason numbers, but since then, <laughs> uh, for this story, I'll put that. I promise I'll put that in this story because I don't know what exactly they are, but I bet they're pretty absurd. There'd be 12 games, 11 and one record. The only lost to LSU when she was in foul trouble and got a ridiculous technical foul. So, and two dumb charges that weren't charges. So, yes. uh, 
Anyway, uh, let's talk about LSU. Speaking of uh, bad officiating, uh, uh, if Iowa gets to the Elite Eight, that's what everyone's talking about. Oh, Iowa got the worst draw of all the one seeds. You look at the odds, Iowa is still the number two national title favorite at plus 550. South Carolina, pretty much an even money favorite, slightly uh, minus money. So South Carolina got gets a pretty good draw, I would say. Uh, Ohio State's the two in their region. Um, or, or, Oregon State? No, no uh, Notre Dame's the two with South Carolina. I'm sorry. My bad. And then uh, the three is Oregon State and the four is Indiana, I believe. Yeah, I was thinking about the projections. Appreciate you clarifying. But LSU is the third choice of among, among among odds makers for the national title. Interestingly, the other number one seeds, Texas is plus fifteen hundred, and USC plus five thousand. A no, a number one seed. So, I th- I feel like there's a perception out there, Dargan, that Iowa would have been better off just playing basically a Pac-12 tournament, you know, type of thing. They would have just rather seen anybody but LSU or UConn. Uh, is that a real, you know, is the fact that they're going to have to probably potentially face an LSU in the Elite Eight? Um, how much does that worry you? Um, I, I mean, I definitely think that Iowa could could struggle against LSU again. I mean, that doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility. Um, you know, one thing I will note is if it does materialize, LSU is probably going to have a pretty emotional second round game playing Louisville in, you know, a, a Haley Van Lith revenge game, so to speak. And so, you know, going through that, and then obviously LSU would have to beat UCLA in all likelihood. Um, so you're talking about what I feel like could potentially be more of a emotionally draining route to the Elite Eight than Iowa has to take. And, you know, whether or not that'll make a difference is TBD, but I think it could. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I was thinking about this last night, and I think the best thing about if Iowa LSU materializes is since it's an Elite Eight matchup, it'll only be discussed for like a day and a half rather than if it was a Sweet 16 matchup or a Final Four matchup and we had to hear about it for a week. And so, um, you know, I think that I, I don't know if that that favors anybody or anything like that, but I do think that that is going to limit some of the, you know, inevitable absurdity that comes with analyzing that, that rematch. And so um, again, like I, you know, Iowa, Iowa didn't have a lot of success last year against LSU. And um, you know, you can chalk that up to a ridiculous shooting performance and maybe LSU doesn't get that again. And I was in the game, you know, for a longer stretch and can take it at the end, but, um, you know, again, it's the Elite Eight, whether it's I, whether it's LSU or UCLA. I mean, you were going to have to, you know, getting the the upset gifts, I guess, that you could call them that Iowa got last year, having to face um, a seven, a six and a five to go to the final four. I mean, that's that just doesn't, you know, really happen all that much, um, particularly on the women's side. So, you know, I guess there could have been a team that maybe would have been a better matchup, but. You know, I just feel like that once if Iowa gets to the Elite Eight against either of those teams, then, you know, this is just what happens when you're really good and you're you're deep in the tournament. You know, you play other good teams and and you got to find a way to make it work. Yeah, looking at LSU's schedule, I mean, I, I kind of looked through Louisville a little bit. I don't see LSU having a ton of trouble with Louisville. I think it'll be, you know, a good storyline, but I feel like it doesn't seem like Louisville is the same type of team it was last year. We'll see. But you're right. It could, you never know. Uh, it's a, it's hard to believe for me that Louisville, I'm sorry, LSU is like a three seed given their resume. I mean, they've. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what, how they are like the third three seed basically, or second three seed. Um, they definitely know. had less turbulence this year than like a UConn who you know is is kind of gone like this while fighting injuries. So. Um, you know, I think I think the LSU season st- certainly started rocky, you know, with the Colorado loss and mm-hmm. just kind of, you know, wrapping your head around the offseason that that was with LSU. But, yeah, I mean, the Tigers seem like they've settled in and they've, you know, found the, the rhythm that works for them with so many big time pieces. Um, and obviously, you know, for all of Kim Mulkey's 
personality flaws. She is a good basketball coach. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I, I knew, I knew that the committee was going to try to orchestrate something along these lines, whether it was Iowa and Juju or Iowa and Yukon or Iowa, you know, Iowa being as big as it is right now, you can pretty much find a good storyline with almost them versus every team that's at the top right now. So, um, as far as, you know, the criticism about, oh, you know, they just put those teams in the same bracket for the ratings matchup. I mean, I was going to get, I was going to be a ratings uh, magnet pretty much anytime they play. So, um, I think that's just where the Hawkeyes are at right now. And, um, that's that's how things are going to be, you know, with this spotlight on them going through this tournament. And then we should talk about the number two seed in this region before we finish up. Uh, that's the UCLA Bruins. Uh, this is a team that's 25 and six. As I mentioned, they lost to USC in like double overtime in the conference tournament. Um, it's good. Yeah, it's a good team. Lauren Betts was was a transfer that Iowa fans wanted. Um, she's she transferred from Stanford to UCLA. And she's six foot seven. She's uh, that could be a problem for Iowa. I mean that that's that's different. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, so so it, you know, be careful what you wish for. Maybe LSU would be an easier path. Who knows? Um, yeah, but this is a good UCLA team. I mean, that's they've beaten you know, just about everybody in their path. Uh, lost to Oregon State. Lost to Stanford. Those are both road games. Uh, the only weird one was kind of a home loss to Washington State. Um, they lost at USC, so those are basically their losses this year. Um, yeah, it's a good team, and and I think that I think there's they're going to have plenty of motivation to beat LSU. And so if we do get to Albany, that'll be fun to watch for you and Absolutely. I. To, you know, especially if Iowa can like take care of business. You know, and then just see who they're going to play. That'll be fun to watch. Um, it, it's going to be the whole bracket's going to be a lot of fun. And, um, you know, it's just going to take their, whoever they're going to play in the Elite Eight, if they get there, it's going to require a great performance uh, because it's not easy. There's a lot more parity in women's basketball now than there used to be. Yeah. And I mean, if you go through the two seeds, I mean, Notre Dame is probably the weakest two seed, but obviously South Carolina was going to get that. They couldn't go with they they weren't going to put them with Ohio State. So it's pretty much did you want UCLA or did you want Stanford? And so, you know, both of them obviously have size that could be a problem for Iowa, um, you know, with Brink and Betts there. But again, you know, it's deep in the tournament. This is these are the types of teams that you're going to have to beat if you want to cement, you know, a, a final four bid. And I was shocked that UCLA has actually never made the final four. So this would be going for their, you know, that could be potentially at stake as well. So, um, you know, uh, it, it'll be, it is, I mean, one thing, I guess, I don't know if this will matter, but UCLA is, you know, maybe traveling as far as anybody um, going from LA all the way to Albany. Um, and obviously, you know, there were so many good PAC 12 teams that somebody was going to have to do that. So, um, and it'll be interesting just to kind of look at the PAC 12 at a whole, the conference was obviously so deep this year and had a lot of good teams that inevitably kind of beat up on each other. And so it'll be interesting to see if that year, you know, the the draining year, the the intense year that the Pac-12 had, if those teams are going to be better in the NCAA tournament or worse in the NCAA tournament for it. Because I think you could probably make a case either way um, that, 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 you know, could go either way. And so, again, you know, one thing that came up repeatedly last night that we've talked about pretty much here and there throughout the whole year is, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that this team is better prepared for the NCAA tournament than Iowa was at this time last year, you know, just dealing with being in the spotlight the whole year, dealing with the environments, dealing with Caitlin's fame, dealing with, you know, everything that comes with being one of the teams at the top. And, you know, again, that there's there's no way to know exactly what is going to make a difference or what isn't going to make a difference. But to have that kind of in your toolbox that, um, you know, you you there's not going to be a moment that is going to overwhelm Iowa. I, I don't think, you know, you know, they may not win. They may not. They may lose a game they're not supposed to. But I just don't think that it's going to be a situation where Iowa feels 
overwhelmed by anything that that is coming. And again, you know, with Caitlin's career ending, there's going to be a lot of emotion, a, a big spotlight on Iowa all the way through. There was going to be regardless, but with, you know, it being the final act of Caitlin's career, certainly going to emphasize that. And so um, you, you talk about another team that that went through what was a draining season at times. Um, you know, Iowa certainly feels like it, it could pay off this time of year. And um, it's easy to see a way that it can, given, uh, you know, what's coming down the road. So a couple of last things. It's important to point out the bracket that Iowa would face if they do make the final four. So we've kind of gone through this path. Uh, the the one seed, as we mentioned, USC is the a number three overall seed. Ohio State is the two seed, and UConn is the three seed in that region. So probably one of those three teams. Uh, Virginia Tech, uh, we'll see if they get Kitley back for the tournament. Mm-hmm. But they're the four seed. So, uh, again, some some familiarity there <laughs> other than USC, uh, but future Big Ten team. So, uh, that I mean, it will be a compelling matchup there if Iowa does make the final four, like Iowa, UConn in the final yep. four. I mean, are you kidding me? That would be so another Iowa, Ohio state matchup. I, mean, uh, I kind of don't want that, but no, I, I would rather them play UConn or yeah. Juju. I'd yeah, rather for watch sure. either one of those. And, but That'd I mean, I, I don't know that like that top three feels just as tough mm-hmm. as Iowa's top three. I mean, I know UConn's not had, you know, the smoothest year, with injuries and stuff like that. But, you know, this is kind of the time that UConn usually gets it together. Um, so in, in Ohio State, I'd imagine they're playing with a lot of motivation too after, ca- you know, coughing up their one seed with with a bad showing in Minneapolis. So, um, and then USC is is obviously kind of seems to be next in line to, to take that spotlight once Caitlin moves on. So, um, yeah, the final four matchup, will, if Iowa gets there, um, will be very intriguing no matter how it shakes out. And, you know, if Iowa wins that, I think we all probably know what's coming in the title game. And um, that'll be that'll be its own animal for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Texas is the other number one seed. So uh, South Carolina's, you know, biggest obstacle is probably Notre Dame and then maybe Texas. Um, Stanford. Stanford. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to do some work to get there for sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel like that. I mean, South Carolina getting to the title game feels I, – I would feel – especially considering their, their title odds are below even money, which yeah. if you follow gambling, to have a team with below even money title odds before the tournament even starts is just absurd. So, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, a couple final notes. The Iowa men play at 8 p.m. Tuesday night in the NIT. Also Kansas State. So the Hawkeyes season continues. The Hawkeyes are a three seed in the NIT. And I think if they win, they play either Saturday or Sunday, probably on the road. So uh, yeah. we will, you know, they won't be in Carver, obviously. No. <laughs> um, they are not going to get the priority. No. So yeah, women have that. So uh, and then Molly Davis, uh, that was the kind of the tangible update of uh, negative update. I would say Lisa Bluter said we were hoping she'd be further along by now. Uh, Jan Jensen said we're still waiting for the swelling to go down. Uh, Molly's still limping. I mean, this has been two weeks since this knee injury. So uh, to do quality physical therapy, you got to get that swelling down. I mean, you can just still doing it, but uh, it just uh, it doesn't. They said she's not or Bluter said they're not ruling Molly out for this week, but it, she's out for this week. There's no way yeah. she's going to play this week. Uh, you know, I. We'll see. It almost seems like Final Four now is probably, in my mind, they didn't say this, but in my mind, I feel like Final Four is probably best case scenario for Molly to return. Well, and Lisa went even further to say that if Molly does come back, you know, in the immediate future, that a Fulcher is probably going to keep that starting spot and they'll bring Davis off the bench, just as, you know, Iowa likes to do that when they're bringing somebody back from injury. Um, and yeah, I mean, when you had Jan Jensen on the radio show and she kind of provided a, an update um, earlier in the week, I assumed that we would get to today and there wouldn't really be a whole lot of change or a whole lot of uh, eye popping info, but that was not the case. I mean, I, that's as uh, detailed of a grim injury update as I've heard Lisa Bluter give pretty much all season, you know, to say not only is she, you know, behind schedule, but, 
you know, they haven't even really fully started the the whole recovery process. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's an unfortunate, an unfortunate caveat here down the stretch that, you know, there's a, at least probably a better than 50% chance that Molly Davis's college career is going to end with her on the bench. Um, but again, you know, you never know when these hurdles come and Iowa has done a decent job this year, avoiding, you know, any major, major injury issues. So, um, it's unfortunate that the timing on this one could, could make a, a difference, you know, in March. But, um, again, that's, that to me was one of the main reason, you know, one of the many reasons why the big 10 tournament was so big was getting Sydney a falter, you know, not comfortable with, you know, that basketball responsibility, but just the comfort with being, you know, in the starting five on a team that's been, you know, arguably the most visible all season. So, um, if you go back to if the Big Ten tournament ends up being a springboard to a deep March run, um, I think you could go back and look at that being you know one of the, the many reasons why. Yeah, well, uh, so we'll focus Wednesday's radio show a little bit more on the men because they're going to have we'll have a game to talk about uh, after Tuesday night. Uh, we went a little longer than I expected, Dargan, but the women, there's so many storylines to talk about here. So uh, really good stuff. And uh, just to finish the Molly Davis thing, uh, they really what they really need probably at this point is just if she can get back for anything like three or four backup minutes for Caitlin Clark. Like if she yeah. has two fouls uh, right now, they have Taylor McCabe running the backup point spot. Now other girls can bring it up the floor, but um, you know, Molly Davis would, is really the only other true point guard on the roster, right? And so you basically at this point can't really afford many more injuries. I mean, if you get another injury, if you get foul trouble, you're out of luck. You're good. The starting five's good. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, you know, they're okay, but you just don't, I mean, you really can't have, you know, 30 plus minutes from Kylie for your You know, it's just not something they've dealt with. Or yeah. Addie, I mean, that's Addie O'Grady can't, you know, they're not prepared to go, you know, a timeshare of O'Grady Goodman, you know, if Stolke goes out, there's just a lot of the margin for error has thinned a lot with Molly out. And it is kind of scary. Definitely. And, you know, again, I, I think we, everybody had confidence that Sydney could step in and, and replace Molly in the starting lineup. But as you pointed out, that takes Sydney off the bench now. And the bench has certainly, you know, lost some firepower with that move. So um, it feels like, yeah, it feels like we're going to have, starter heavy minutes, you know, all the way through. And obviously that's not surprising with it being March, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if anybody, if there are any other injury issues that come up um, over the next month, they could, that could certainly be pretty crippling. Thanks, Dargan. Good show today. Thanks Hawkeye fans for joining us. If you made it to the end, we really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll be back with you Wednesday for Hawk Central on radio. Uh, interviews from Iowa city are, Friday, the first four game is Thursday, so a lot of women's basketball to come this weekend from Iowa City, uh, Dargan Southern, Chad Lystico. We might even see a Tyler Tashman appearance at the women's Cameo. Tournament. It could happen. Uh, we'll see how the men do tomorrow night. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining us so long. Talk to you next time.